This is a recording for the Cuppa Project. My name is Matthew O'Brien. Today is the 28th of August 2023 and I have here with me Joe Hayden. Thank you very much, Joe. Can you confirm for the recorder that you're happy to take part in the project? Indeed I am. Brilliant. And could you just spell your name for the recorder, please? It's Joe Hayden and it's J-O-E H-A-Y-D-E-N. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Joe. Could you tell me a little bit about your early life? Um, when and where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in the town of Enniscorthy in Wexford, where all my family were born. Uh, but my parents lived here on the farm in Kilvaney, uh, just outside the village of Tinnahealy in South County Wicklow. And I've never lived anywhere else other than, than here. I uh, went to local school, uh, left school, left school when I was 15, uh, because at that time I had three younger brothers, I had an older sister, uh, my dad was quite unwell. We, had, we were dairy farmers with, with other enterprises as well, but the dairy being the most important one. But due to my dad's ill health, they had decided to sell the dairy herd of about 35 cows. I said, no, don't. Uh, I'll leave school, I'll come home, I'll milk the cows and look after them. So on the 2nd of June in 1975, I left school. I came home to milk the cows. And I've been here milking cows for the last 48 pl- years, Matthew. And your memories of school, were they good in the time that you were there? Uh, yeah, I, we went to two different primary schools. We went to Tinnahili and uh, it was good. It was a little bit chaotic. There were issues there. And we were brought to, when I was in fourth class, I moved to another local school in Akara, which was an excellent primary school. And uh, I'm, sure I be- I'm sure I benefited from it. But never had the same level of friendship that I had uh, achieved in the in the first school so and then for the two years of post primary I went to a secondary school in, in Wexford town called St Peter's College so I had two years there and I did enjoy that uh, because uh, I love sports and it was a real sports academy football hurling tennis handball squash anything you wanted to play you could cross country running it was all available there uh, I I didn't mind academia, but I was really just on always on a countdown to coming back to the farm. That's what I wanted to always do. And do you have any particularly fond memories of your childhood on the farm? Without picking out any particular ones, I would say I had an extremely happy childhood. Extremely happy childhood. Living, working, having freedom, the freedom that you have on a farm. Uh, working, working hard, um, because, and everybody worked on the farm when you came home from school. But it was a very happy home. It was a very supportive home of of the children. We had a, a wide extended family of of aunts and uncles, most of whom were not married, and who subsequently, in time, gifted their farms and everything to to my brothers, and in a very generous way of keeping the the family farms within within the family. And what was community life like then in the area? What was social life like? What did you do outside the farm mm. for the phone as well? Oh, uh, my dad would have been quite involved in a number of things in parish life. He wasn't really a sports person, but he loved to go to football matches. We played football with the local team and yeah we went around he was active in community things organizing money for church and halls and all this type of thing so there were always festivals and different kinds of country madness going on and of course we had the local agricultural show in Tinnahealy always which has now become one of the biggest uh, agricultural shows in Ireland and would you have gone to that as a child as well oh yeah we would have gone to that and we would always have gone to the spring show which was i suppose a pre-runner to today's uh, plowing uh, plowing championships and and would you still go today to this day to the plowing i would go every three or four years to tinny healy show every year but i'm quite active in the organizational side of the show very good um and Within the area, what was the typical kind of occupation or vocation um, among community people? I suppose it is very much a strong farming community, and it is a, it is a good farming community that there are a reasonable amount of good sized farms with reasonable quality land, and a lot of you know I think enterprising people 
you know, in, in the area as well. There was a lot of daring in the area. And uh, so we grew up in, I suppose, a very positive type of agriculture environment, you know, that to, to farm was good, to aspire to farm was good. Yeah, and to, and to do it well and to take pride in your work. And how do you think, or has that changed in your time growing up and, and working here when you were younger to today? I suppose I grew up in a household where we were really enthusiastic about our farm. We were proud of our farm and a way of life. There was never anything, oh, we're, we're just farmers. You know, we were very proud of it. And I always aspired to be a farmer. Uh, and I'm as enthusiastic today as I was then. I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing, Matthew, but I, I love the way of life. I, I'm very passionate about it. I feel those of us who farm and produce food for our fellow man are endowed with great responsibility uh, to provide and to produce the best food possible for those who will buy it, cook it and consume it for their families and that we do it in a way that does not impact on the natural environment, that we minimize the impact on climate, and that we do it in a way that, you know, that respects that part of creation of which we are all part of. And even with, say, farming practices and your own farming practices, have they changed over time? They, they have, farming has always changed from the time man first settled from being a nomad and it continues to it has always changed so change is you know it is always changing but it always remains the same okay and we're in a period of great transition at the moment because we recognize I suppose we've always recognized that the way that we farm in this country pasture based farming uh, you know is one that is good for for man and beast and environment and climate but now we have the support of science and knowledge which is telling us that you have always been doing a reasonably good job but it can be done better and that it must be done better and it must be done better very quickly because we are part of the climate problem but we're part of the solution and part of my own work as well as farming is in that space of conversation about uh, how we tell the story of good food production in Ireland and looking at the pillars of sustainability and how we can implement those in practical successful ways on our farms. And again just go back to your childhood did you have a favorite job on the farm? Like every young guy driving tractors was my favorite job milking cows was not right uh, every 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 young guy wants to, or a girl probably you know wants to drive but i've done the full circle on that in that three weeks ago we bought a new tractor i don't even know how to start it actually my passion now is milking cows I probably will learn someday. Now, unfortunately, my brother and the guy who works on the farm, they can drive the tractor. It's very high tech. And, uh, but we kind of specialize now in the different jobs on the farm. And I may learn to drive it, but I'll probably never do much work with it. But I will commit myself to doing the best I can in making the care of my cows. I might come back to that just a little later on. Um, on the context or in the context of kind of changing environments how has the sense of community and community life maybe changed in your time living in, in this area i think community life is very still very strong i think for within the farming community we are one we are one we're very diverse and maybe we're an example of how diversity can work uh, it, when, when you're farming in rural ireland you're never alone uh, if you have a personal problem within a family problem, a financial problem, uh, a, the tractor breaks down, it will all be resolved by those around you. You may have to look for some help, but oftentimes it comes to you because you have that sense of awareness within the community where everybody's looking out for everybody and people will just 
kind of turn up say we hear there's a problem can we help and it's still there thankfully Matthew it's, we're very blessed in that uh, it, we have maintained that and it's really really important that we maintain that that social uh, value that you get in Irish agriculture and also that I suppose we recognize that you know if we run our farm business as well if we do the best we can others will benefit others will benefit uh, young people will benefit from our enthusiasm and wanting to come back and continue the tradition uh, those who are involved in servicing the agricultural community will develop and invest in their products and services and the towns the villages will be full of people and children will be filling the schools and the sports club and our own community in Haiti like what a place to live you know we, we have we have everything we have we have our art center we have our library we have we have two or three good pubs <laughs> good places to eat you know we have we have the strongest cultus group in county wicklow uh, we have the largest juvenile ga club in county wicklow we're not very big but we're good and you mentioned sports earlier on you mentioned it again there um was that important for you growing up yes Yes, it was because when I was growing up, you, you didn't have um, you didn't have a cinema close by. You didn't have the other type of, I suppose, entertainment options that were around. So it was very much community based, and so you had school. So you had your friends playing on the football team, and you had you had you had guys from other schools playing on as well, which brought you into a connection with a wider reach of community as well. And I suppose within a farming community, all you know, even like the show, it brought people from different communities of because within any community there were different schools depending on maybe uh, maybe uh, you know the, the religious ethos or whatever, and so those things brought those people together, you know, as well. And and the great thing about the values in agriculture, I suppose I saw growing up was that <clears throat> despite our own faith tradition. Um, all of my parents, friends, the people who came to our home were from a different religious tradition and there were no barriers. Now sometimes they had good healthy discussions about the differences but they were, they were such good friends, you know, so uh, ecumenism didn't just kind of happen 10 or 15 years ago. It was alive and well in, in this area when I was growing up as a small child. And do you think that's maintained today? Yes, it is. More so. You mentioned the Tine Healy show, um, and I think it was on recently. That's right, August Bank Holiday Monday every year. And tell me a little bit about the show. If you were to go to it, what would you kind of see? What would you? What would the yeah. activities be? Well, it, it it grew out of of a pony gym kinda, the first of which was held in nineteen thirty five, and it has run without a break except for the two years of COVID. So we're nearly 90 years on the go. Wasn't there the first time myself, mind you. But we would have grown up there, and I suppose when we got into our late teens, we became involved. Everybody in, in the area, especially from the farming background, would have been involved in some way in the show. So your, your, your skill as a sheep farmer brought you into working with the sheep section. As a dairy farmer, you were probably put on the, the Frisian ring. You know, um, people who were into gardening were involved in the you know in the flower tent all this kind of thing so everybody's skills were valued and utilized there and everybody had something to bring everybody there and there are very few organizations that can reach out to a total community okay that it's not not one particular group it has evolved it has evolved to being a huge event with around 20,000 people we probably had our most successful event ever, but it's become a large, I suppose, celebration of rural life. It's you know, it's the richness and traditions of that, and it as it has grown, it has expanded its reach to bring more people in to help with it. All the sporting organisations are now involved. Uh, the GA club will take responsibility for car parking. Uh, the ladies football club will take responsibility for ticket sales the local soccer club will take 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 a role for stewarding in another car park all of that and they they, they take ownership and responsibility for a particular element so it it's fair again it's more inclusive than ever yet it has retained its ethos of an agricultural show but also allowing you know uh, for 
the commercial side of it for companies from Wicklow and surrounding counties to exhibit their products and services you know it's proven very very successful in doing that and for those outside of the area and for those outside of the sphere of agriculture it, it allows people from 8 to 80 from 8 months to 80 to come to an event where they can see smell and touch the richness of rural life and food and the wonderful people behind it and all of those other people in community who support that ethos and do you have any particular memory of being at the Tim Hilly show um, or do you have a favourite memory or a favourite experience that you had there or an interaction with someone at the show or does anything stand out in your memory of the Tim Hilly show uh, one was this year at the end of the show it was late in the evening and I had gone out to one of the car parts to take down some some signs that we had there welcoming people to the show and two teenage girls came dancing down out of the field they must have been the last people to leave and they were so joyful and they ran by me saying we will see you in August 2024 and they were I suppose and, and to, to see that joy on people's lives and there was a second one I'd like to share with you this year the show has expanded into kind of a country fest as well where we erect this joint outdoor stage for dancing with uh, it was some of the top country bands this year we had Derek Ryan and I remember being up at the top of this natural amphitheatre that we have in the show and looking down right and the dance floor can take about 300 people but the stewards were there and they would allow 300 people on to dance for three songs they would then let in another 300 and another three. there were thousands of people and to see the movement of people and maybe 5,000 people watching people having a drink having something to eat meeting friends making new friends and watching the joy and celebration of people just just getting away from the worries of every day um, I think Tinny Healy Show could, can do the body and the soul a lot of good and is it in the same location every year? yes the, far, the show actually bought its own showgrounds it bought a farm over 30 years ago they were very ambitious you know, and that's just, and these were, these are country people who had this vision for their community of putting down roots for the rest of time, you know, and ensuring that it would be run in a professional way and that every year that people, the ambition of the show is that every year people come back, it's a better show than they, they were at last year. And you mentioned the strength of community um, that exists in Tinahili. Yes. Um, and of the kind of some of the services and facilities that exist as well. Um, are there any interesting stories that you're aware of, or like even maybe folk tales of Tinahili or from the surrounding areas, or is there any significant part of history that is well known in these parts? I, I think there is. There's history around, you know, going right back to I suppose Stone Age. There's a lot of history around seventeen ninety eight. Okay. There is a lot of tradition. Uh, even on this particular farm okay we are uh, the family here the Haydens we are we are known to the old people as the Haydens of the Black Rahins the Black Rahins a Rahin with a fairy fort it was a circle and just at the road top of the road here the the road that's up here is a new road okay it was built around I suppose around 1880 okay the road from Gori to Tinahili and it went straight through one of the Rahins, but they were known as the Black Rahins, and our family always carried that name. The Rahins of Fairy Fort, so the Haydens of the Black Rahins. The name of this house is Rahin Dove. The, the name of my farm business is Rahin Dove Farms. So we, we build, we continue to hold on to that identity, you know, in a very, in a very different but very authentic way that reflects the times that we live in. On our farm here, just below the farmyard itself, the town stand there is called Turbo Patrick. It, that's the Well of Patrick. So it's a very famous historical site. And it, it goes back right to St. Patrick's time where local history and folklore tells that St. Patrick blessed it on his way. Um, he traveled from the farm here over towards Coola Fancy uh, to the town stand over there called Cross Patrick. That's where he said mass. And that's where they built the big wooden cross 
okay and it was known as cross patrick and it stood for hundreds of years my brother matt actually was involved over 20 years ago in putting up another giant uh, wooden cross to celebrate that the earlier i referred to some uh, recordings with my great grandfather also joe hayden in the year 1927 and in it he spoke about the the local tradition of st patrick's well and St. Patrick's Well was kind of restored in the late 1990s under, with funding from the Leader Programme, okay, which recognised the importance of this place. And in his verbal uh, recording, he said that, he, now remember our family came here in 1865, in August 1865. So, so he, was, he was born here. But when, but his father had told him, that's my grandfather, great grandfather Michael Hayden, told my grandfather that before the famine on St. Patrick's Day, there was a pattern held at the well. But s such had it grown in popularity that they had to move it to the field in front of the old family home here. And that over one and a half thousand people used to turn up on St. Patrick's Day. Now, whatever about one and a half thousand people turning up today who have cars and ways of getting here, these people, they had neither bicycle, car, and probably haven't didn't even have a horse. So people walked here, you know. I suppose this was a few short years after the, the penal laws were revoked as well. So people were, were free to express their faith in, in public. You know, they could, they could gather communally um, to do that. So the, the tradition continues in a lesser way. But the tradition is strongest toward, around the whole concept of pilgrimage, prayer and healing is strongest among the traveller community. And they have a huge devotion to the well. So all down the years we've had, and my mother in particular had a great relationship with some of the traveller families who, who came here. And, uh, and they still come here. They're here not every day, you know, and they have a very, very strong devotion to it in bringing, bringing their families, their children, they're, they're older members of family who are unwell uh, in in their belief that that healings and blessings will be received from coming to that place yeah and it's very it's very beautiful yeah and we, we 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 i love to meet up with them down there and it's great it's great so you might that might answer my, my next question but would you have a favorite kind of ancient site or archaeological site within maybe the immediate area or the, the broader way for well, obviously St. Patrick's well, okay, um, because it wasn't just seen as a holy well, it was also seen as a source of water and nourishment to uh, people in the local community as well, okay. Um, other places around, I suppose my own connection is with my land. I, I, see, I, see, I see what some people see in the well in all of creation around my farm I can find that special place in any of the fields in spending time with my animals yeah that, that the gift of nature is it's, it's all there it's just to be receptive to it it doesn't have to be a particular point yeah I mean we all love Glendalough we love going for a walk in Glendalough and we love going to different places or whatever but uh, for me it's uh, I can I can tap into it anywhere here, yeah. And um, I wonder if you could tell me more, talk to me a little bit more about the evolution of dairy farming. Sure. Or the your kind of watch. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Kind of yeah. The the story of dairy farming this far family is really interesting. My father never milked a cow until he got married, <laughs> and this was the it, it was the influence of my mother's mother my my granny woodburn as we called her who was a very dynamic woman now you must remember that dairy farming was very much located in ireland around a train station you had to be able to get the, the horse to bring the milk to the train station where it went to dublin so that was the tradition that's why tradition had a lot around wooden bridge around arc Row, and also to Nihili because we had a train station we had daily train service to dublin city okay uh, crazy to think about it, you know, that it was that good that you could commute to Dublin every morning in, in, in 1905, you know. 
uh, and come back again that evening. However, anyway, when my m mother and father met and decided to get married, my granny Woodburn said she wanted to walk the land. I'm not sure if you ever heard that term, but walking the land was something that the parents of the bride did to see was it up to scratch? Was she marrying into, you know? And I suppose it was a survival thing, you know. Was was her daughter going to somewhere uh, where they would be able to have a family and live reasonably well and all of that? So she came up here one Sunday to walk the land, and my my dad brought her all around the farm. And when my mother and my granny were going home that evening, my mother said to Granny, "What did you think of the farm?" And she said, Eileen, Eileen's my mother's name. She said, Eileen, really good farm, but there's one thing missing. And she said, what's that? She said, there's no milking cows. But she said, I'll fix that. So she gave a dowry with which my dad and my mum built uh, a new cow house, as it was called then. And they bought a three unit bucket plant, which was the latest technology in electronic milking of cows. And they bought 11 cows. And we've been milking cows ever since. <laughs> okay, so they started with that. And then when I had decided to come home, uh, my father would have been very progressive in his thinking for his generation. He was, he was in a different league um, and very ambitious for his children in farming and in education. So when I had decided to come home after, I decided I would come home in June 75 when I finished second year post-primary, he decided to build a new milk parlor for me so that I'd get off to a good start. So he built what was then a state-of-the-art 60 unit herringbone milk parlor, right? So I came home, 15 years old, to this spanking brand new milking facility with a new bug tank, a new dairy. So like I arrived with the silver spoon in my mouth in so many ways. So that's why I've had a blessed life. You know, I got off to a good start. I got loads of encouragement. And that parlour worked for many years, and it was in 1994 that we changed it, and we built a 14 year old milking parlour. And just over a year ago, we opened our latest addition, which is that big building just down there, and it's a 46 unit next generation carousel. As well as the dairy farm, there were probably other things going on in your life at the time. There were, there were indeed. Uh, when I was 16, and I was a year farming at that time. I had this idea, this vision, this dream that this beautiful farm that we lived on was something so special uh, that we should look at some way of sharing it with other people. So this is just a, this is just an idea, a concept, uh, another half mad teenager. Okay, uh, but it took time before that evolved. But when I got into my late teens, I became involved on a social level in Mark and the Firma, which was a rural youth organisation with a very strong uh, focus on, well, on social, on education and, and agriculture. Okay. And I got involved there. And over a bit of time, I got involved in the leadership side of it and I became involved at national level and I went on to represent our country at European level as well. Okay. And that brought me into contact with I suppose a wider circle of people and knowledge and experience and I loved the, the journeys to Europe and they usually coincided with going to visit farms and other ent rural enterprises out there. And while I was on the National Council of Makra, one of the projects I became involved in was, and it was a first for Ireland, was setting up a, a company whose sole focus was to bring tourists into rural areas to stay in rural areas and to participate in activities in rural areas only. And uh, it was called it was called community tours, right? And we got that up and running, employed two professional marketing people, and it started tipping along fine. But Macra did what it always did was once it got to the stage of it working, it sold it on and moved on to a fresh initiative themselves. Okay, but one of the people who was employed, Carmen Needham was her name, she actually bought the company. And because we had a you know, we knew each other quite well, had worked, uh, she started sending some groups, uh, agricultural study groups to the farm here. This was before Ryanair, so coming to Ireland, or leaving Ireland was Dublin, Ross Lair. we were en route, so we were taking in these groups of farmers on a fee-paying basis to look at how a dairy farm in Ireland worked. 
and I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that, and it it meant that that the world was coming to us. We started off then looking at what else could we do, so we started off doing tea, coffee, and scones in the house. We subsequently moved on to uh, doing lunches in the house. Uh, there was then the threat of divorce that you couldn't rear children and run a restaurant all in the one space, <laughs> and and we were, I mean, you nearly cringe when you look back at what we did, but we were. We were doing our own market research in a very practical way. We were seeing was there a market there? Did these people have an appetite for the type of experience we could give on a family-run farm? And it seemed to be working. At that time, the farm was tipping along quite well, but I was always interested in things outside the farm and a bigger picture. At this stage, I had left Mokra, but I had become very involved in rural development. And part of my work at Mokra as well was not just looking at agric- agriculture industry, but looking at agriculture uh, as part of as an inclusive rural economy, okay, to looking at a total plate that agriculture in itself wasn't was you know you know it needed more than than itself. It it needed an inclusive economy, right? And I was quite involved in the the technical preparation side of of work on that, okay. And I then became involved in what was then known as Colette and Country, okay, uh, which was a local community group based in Carnew, who had this vision of expanding enterprise and business and training facilities in our local villages. So all of this was going on, and, and I really enjoyed it. It was very challenging, but I was learning things and I was meeting people with very different skills. I then decided, along with my wife, we decided to look at the option of building a visitor centre on the farm. Do we take this seriously? You know, there was no point in getting to 50 years of age and having regrets. We said, here it goes. So we 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 got funding from Leader for a feasibility study. And we employed a firm of consultants to do that. And their findings were very conclusive, uh, which were that under no circumstances should this project proceed. Okay. We were going to proceed anyway. And I suppose what we the, the, what the uh, feasibility study did do was it did identify, you know, um, strong points and weak points, strengths and weaknesses, you know, of, of any such uh, venture. So we, we, we went ahead with that, borrowing ridiculous amounts of money to do so and entering into it, building a big business and undertaking things that we really should not have undertaken because we didn't have the skills of employing people of compliance around food and beverage and all that kind of thing uh, the insurance issues but we persevered and it was to say it was difficult probably would be an understatement but we kept going and it, it did evolve and it has evolved into a very successful business. One of the things we identified very early was that we needed a really good partner. And because we were supplying Latitude Lambia Co-op, who were in turn providing all the cream for Bailey's Cream Liqueur in Dublin, we said, okay, maybe there's an opportunity here. So we rang the marketing people in Bailey's and said, you know, you could probably do with a farmer to tell the story of how the cream is produced but they were having none of it. But we rang them every month for a year and they eventually conceded to send, I think just to get us off their back, to send down a couple of groups to visit us, Matthew. And the people who came, and these were brand and marketing people from the United States who were involved in developing the, the Baileys, developing Bailey sales on, on that side of the Atlantic. And that seemed to go okay. So that evolved over time to us becoming the international guest farm for the Baileys brand. So we're fully licensed by Bailey's to call ourselves the Bailey's Farm. Okay, we trade under the Bailey's Farm for our overseas visitors, and that experience, or that work around Bailey's, uh, comes in a number of ways. One is we now do all of the training and induction with all of the global marketing teams. So we bring them down to the farm, we show them the values around producing this wonderful, the best cream in the world. Um, we look at the pillars of sustainability, we look at how, I suppose, it, it enthuses them, allows them to identify with the product in a way that they would never have identified with any product. They take ownership of that and to really feel part of it and to feel good about it. 
we provide a range of services then to other guests who comes around everything from uh, meeting the Bailey's ladies who are our 220 cows we allow them to take selfies with their favorite lady we uh, do tasting workshops we have a mobile pop-up bar we travel over Ireland with that so it's become really really big but the but the business itself also trades under the Orchard Centre which is a provider of conferencing and and training for Irish based companies so we work very much in the sphere of the corporate sector uh, with a lot of the multinational companies and we provide I suppose experimental learning through team, outdoor team building but also provide state of the art conference facilities and food and beverage as well but one of the most interesting things has been that I suppose we always, I've always believed that there is potential everywhere. So during COVID, we decided to look at where was the new potential. And we felt that the new potential was in the area of telling the story of, of Irish food. Uh, nearly 90% of Irish food is exported out of this country. So we got involved in, you know, in providing a package where, you know, we could in the classroom setting you know, look at all the technical aspects of, of dairy farming in Ireland, looking at the pillars of sustainability, looking at how farmers like ourselves were going to achieve this 25% reduction in emissions by the year 2030, and then bring them out to the farm and letting them see in practice and, and to mirror in practice the values that we had spoken about earlier to show that this is possible this is achievable and these are the incremental steps that we will be taking to achieve those so that has that has evolved very successfully for us and that we now do all the graduate training for you know for Borbia, for Tirlon, for Bailey's yeah so we're involved in meeting all these wonderful bright young people who've come out of college who've gone through the graduate programs but we equip them with the understanding the knowledge the confidence and the language to tell that story and it's really interesting Matthew I love yeah. it yeah. it's love it and I feel it's um, I suppose I do feel that all of us are here at this time in this place for a purpose and I think if we open ourselves to that to identify what is our purpose I think life can be great so part of my purpose is to do the best I can with my cows and my farm and if I can to play some small part in telling the story of Irish food, Irish family farming, why it must be protected and why it is good for the farmer, the consumer, the environment and the, and, and the planet and we have to be very serious about it. Talk to me a little bit more about the pillars of sustainability. The pillars of sustainability, the four primary ones that I would refer to, one would be financial stability. If my farm, you remember, for in, in, in Ireland, because all our farms are family owned, we are the custodians of the countryside. So we need to have a viable business so that we can live and exist there. We don't need to be rich, but we need to be able to live, to, to build our homes, to raise our kids, to educate them, to have the odd night out. <laughs> maybe a bit of a holiday all of the things that, that people like to do for their own personal and family sustenance okay so financial viability so we, we, we need to better make money pay our bills and reinvest and in particular in the context of climate change on dairy farms we have to make huge investments in our business financial investments if we're going to meet the targets okay and we're doing that I, I'm not giving up about it I'm not whinging about it I'm just stating it as a fact and I see it as a great challenge that are that are relish. Okay, that's one. The other then is reducing emissions. The three emissions are methane, ammonia, ammonia, um, and carbon. Okay, as a dairy farmer, as every dairy farmer has already been part of the sustainability program for the last ten years, where we are measuring carbon on our farms and we're, we've been very successful in that. So we already know a lot, and we're way ahead of the posse when it comes to other countries, okay? The next one then is water quality. We must protect the quality of the waters in our rivers and streams and, and, and wells or whatever the water source is, and we must ensure that our farming practices as such 
are not impacting on that and there are a lot of strategies being implemented at the moment around that there are issues they're more localized rather than all over but we need to implement best practice based on science and and good practice and and, and reason as well and the final one then is biodiversity you know that uh, you know that the that the land is here the land on my farm is here not just for me and not just for my animals but for that greater community that live on the farm birds the animals the bees the insects so we need to look at how we can improve things there and we can actually improve things really easily without impacting on any commercial aspects of the farm around the type of trees that we have the type of hedgerows that we plant how we manage the hedgerows how we allow wildflowers and herbs you know to grow rather than cutting them uh, during during the main summer months so just farming a little bit smarter but those are the key things and you mentioned that you get tourist groups to the farm yes and they can get their selfies with the Bailey ladies <laughs> yeah um, would the majority of them be coming from Ireland or would they be coming from abroad do you think about 80% is coming from overseas yeah about 80% is coming from overseas um, yeah there's yeah about 80% is coming from overseas 20% is kind of Irish more or less corporate corporate work yeah that's kind of this you know and we would you know and obviously the, the, the market is always changing you know we would traditionally have got a lot of uh, business from Russia that's that's not existent at the moment probably won't be for quite a considerable length of time you would have the US market which is very strong at the moment that's always influenced by things like the economy there uh, by election years all these things it's influenced it I suppose we we learned very early that if if we were very dependent on a particular market that it left you very exposed right so our strongest markets us were, were Central Europe and Scandinavia and they were always very good but it concerned me that if it was a problem in the Eurozone for example you know it was a really big problem for us so we needed to to spread the business risk so the first place we looked at was Asia okay and we decided to look at India and I met a very interesting lady from uh, from Mumbai at a, a sales workshop one time and I asked her could we work together and uh, she said sure so we have been very successful in the Indian market and in bringing large corporate groups over here now they're not going to eat a good old Wicklow lamb or anything like that they're very much into their own food so we have to provide Indian cuisine for those on site but a lot of those groups are big they can be up to 300 people and we can see 320 people in our bar and restaurant the other big market then would be would be the United States yeah, uh, for example, we got huge business this weekend because of the college football. Yeah, and those groups that are coming over are they availing of um, orchard centre kind of packages as well as the Bailey Farm, Bailey's Farm, or are are they often separated? So just repeat that one. Probably. Sorry. So uh, the people that are coming over, the corporate kind of groups that are coming over, do they do both the farm and the say team building or something like that in the orchard centre, or yeah. oftentimes are they one yeah. or the other? Yeah. Okay. The, the the trend would in the the, the, the trends have changed, um, and some of that has been delivered by us. So for a lot of people coming here, the lot of the American cor for the, the overseas corporates, they were not necessarily going out to the farm. They were doing the team building, but the team building was around culture, or around maybe running a, a hurling skills workshop, a baron playing skills workshop, doing turf stacking, tug of war, other traditional sports. But once the we saw the potential of Baileys with Baileys because it's such a strong brand all over the world, we started to change our focus. So look, a must for everybody who comes to the farm is to meet the ladies themselves. So there will be, before the groups will arrive, there will be this sense of anticipation of meeting the most wonderful cows in the world to produce the cream for their babies, cream liqueur. So that's part and parcel of every group now. Now, prior to COVID, 90% of the, 
Irish Corp groups would come would not go near the farm. Okay. After COVID, ninety percent of them go to the farm because there is this new interest in food, and there's this new interest around the narrative of food production and climate change. And these people want to know what's going on. So we give them a little bit better background to ourselves and our involvement in that whole story and telling the story of sustainability on Irish dairy farms and what we've achieved ourselves. So that's usually now part of the program is to go visit the farm as well and to look at how we are making great strides forward in reducing emissions and even looking at things like how we're using science and technology in our milking systems. Every cow is microchipped. You know, we can milk 220 cows in one hour with one person. You know, you know, and it, it's, it's entertaining, it's fascinating, and I'd like to think it's, doing a re, it's playing an important role in allowing those outside of the food production, production cycle to see what's really happening and what these challenges of climate mean and what steps are being taken by farmers on the ground. So everything can be sold, Matthew. Every concept, you know, you know, it's 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 trying to recognise what's happening out there, and we we do have that. I suppose we're fortunate uh, that we do see the bigger picture, and that telling the story can be good business. So, if we were to talk about it a little bit more broadly, there in terms of tourism for a moment, how would you view the kind of current? status or state of tourism in the Wicklow Mountains? I don't know. I'm, I'm not tuned in enough to know how, how well tourism is or isn't doing um, because our own offering here is kind of isolated from what everybody else is doing. Like the groups that come here will get on a bus and they will drive down from Dublin. They may visit Lendelock or Powers Court, but that's it. They won't be staying in local accommodation. They won't be availing of local restaurants. They won't be availing of local pubs. Um, they won't be going for a walk in the woods locally. That's the nature of the particular, what we call incentive tourism, high-end tour experience that these people are looking for. And I think it's really important that, that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be seen as, and I've heard this from people, that oh, it's a shame that they're not staying in the local B&Bs. They're never going to stay in the local B&Bs. There are other people who will stay in the local B and Bs, and you need to find those people. But my people won't. And then, what do you think some of the biggest challenges that tourism might bring to smaller areas, even? I think it's it's the expect you know you have to look at what is the expectation of the tourists coming, the level of service, the professionalism behind it, uh, and not just I ah, should it be all right. It it doesn't work like that. A lot of these people are, you know, we are an expensive destination now, you know, and that people spend, people don't have a problem spending money, but their expectations are that the experience should match what they're paying for, you know. So I, I but I, I think, uh, not I think, I, I believe that the, the quality of services has improved dramatically and continues to improve. You can see that within the community groups. I can see that in my own village of Tinahili around the professionalism of the people who've done the walks. I mean, they're as good as you'll find anywhere in the world. Talk to me a little bit more about those walking businesses and trails, because they're obviously huge now. With the they're businesses. huge, yeah. And when when that initiative first started, um, I don't know, it was maybe 20 years ago or more, Matthew, it was seen as a little bit, are you really serious about this? And you had people going down on the Saturday afternoon to the railway, the railway, the old railway with slash hooks and wheelbarrows to cut briars and trees and weeds and everything, in the belief that people would actually come and walk from from there over over uh, towards some of the Finnock Wood. Um, but they persevered. They tapped into the financial resources and the expertise that was available, and. Uh, but the Tom and Finnog walk was hugely successful. The the you know the uh, the Tucker walk then was very successful, uh, and um, also yeah the the, the the Tucker walk. The railroad, the railway walk from Tinnahilly over to Tom and Finnog, and then Tom and Finnog Wood itself. Okay, 
have all been huge successful and then they, d they moved into a different category which were the looped walks around Tinnahili okay for people who were into serious walking people who for whom people for people for whom walking was a holiday and obviously guest houses the guest houses around have benefited hugely from that some of the pubs of like the dying cow have benefited hugely from that it's become a mecca it's number one on, on TripAdvisor you know now they're building I think they're building um, glamping pods up there as well so you know the, the initiative is there and I think you need people who have a little bit of not madness but who are who are crazy enough to go and borrow money and invest in something but who do the research as well who do the research as well and have you done any of the trails or any of the walking trails? oh yeah I've walked them yeah I've walked them I mean I can't say I'm an avid walker I get lots of walking every day on the farm had you <laughs> yeah and would you have a favourite walk that you would do oh Tam 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 Finog, very special place yeah it's a very special place and you, what would you kind of see if you were in Tom Finog like, if I was with you now on a trail what would I be seeing around me I think it's more what I feel rather than what I see yeah, I feel that sense of history, that sense of nature. Yeah, it's not. It's not about. I think you you could yeah you could, you'd have a, could have a great time time with your eyes closed. Yeah. Now, obviously, my favorite spot in it is a bridge that crosses over down the far end. Of that little stone bridge, something about that bridge. Yeah. So if you had a group of tourists and let's say you weren't bringing them. Here or the orchard centre, where where would you bring Tamil Yeah, Tamil Finnock. Yeah, definitely. And for you, what would the most important aspects of maybe local natural heritage be? Would it be you know the maintenance of landscapes? Would it be protecting biodiversity? What do you think the most pressing maybe challenges in that regard? I think it's all of them together, you know. I don't think we just should pick them out, it has to, yeah. We have to have a plan. We have to have a plan and to maintain obviously the beautiful landscape that we have. We have to maintain um you know, the indigenous industry of agriculture, its services and all the other things that are happening. And obviously now COVID was a great experiment. You know, you can live in Tinahili and run a company in Hong Kong. You know, so a lot of good things have happened. A lot of good things have happened. So, yeah, and you need people living in communities. You need people bringing p money into communities, not just the farmers. It, it's going to take it takes more than the farmers to sustain it in today's world, because farming itself is not labour intensive anymore. And do you think the landscape then of upland areas does this have affected or impacted the way in which you live? No. No, they haven't impacted how I live. They may have impacted some other people, but not myself. And is there any particular challenge with dairy farming in a, a more upland area? I think it is. Yeah, obviously, uh, this you know the the, cap the capacity mm. or the potential to to grow grass and crops is much greater. Yeah, and you also have a huge problem in upland areas with deer. So it's nearly come pro become prohibitive for some. To farm in a practical way because one is the the problem with them actually grazing you know the the overpopulation so the the you know the natural balance of the deer living in the wood uh, is gone their the, the overpopulation of the species sees them having to move out of their natural habitat which is woodland into grassland uh, for food and they're competing with with animals and farmers are suffering hugely because of that I think that's a, a known fact, as well as disease factors as well. So, how much would you consider yourself to be from the Wicklow Mountains? I'm sure I am. I'm part of the Wicklow Mountains, aren't you? It's an old significance for you to be from the Wicklow Mountains. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just curious in terms of like the identity. Like, what, what do you think the kind of maybe the characteristics or traits people from the Wicklow Mountains are 
I think Wicklow has a has a very diverse uh, group of people, even farmers. Farmers up in the uplands are very different to farmers down here. I I would be termed down the lowlands here. So they're 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 different. They they farm in a very different way because they're they're farming mountains. They're farming a lot of sheep. You won't get much dairying up there. It's you know there are not many many dairy farms. There never were. There probably never will be. You know, so I think they they have they they have they have a lot of challenges. They have a lot of challenges. Okay. So, how would you describe Tenny Healy to somebody who's never been here before? It's a small village in South County Wicklow. One that it's a thriving village. It has its own historical significance. It was part of the. Uh, Colatin Estate, the Fitzwilliam, Fitzwilliam Estate, and that has obviously, as a as as a town close to the estate house itself, it has its own, uh, um, I suppose, um, characteristics around that. Some of the buildings, the old courthouse, uh, the old jail, which is now the, the 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 library, the the old hotel. You know, it was it. You know, it. It suffered down through our history. It was burnt in 1798. You know, it rebuilt itself, but it always had a very strong farming community. It had a diverse community in that because it was close to the Colatin estate, it would have had, you know, a larger than normal uh, population of people who were Protestant, right? And I suppose I always saw that as a, you know, as a great, great blessing in our community in that you know the relationships obviously never perfect but as I said in the earlier part of my interview you know with my own family just the strength of those relationships and how well it worked how well it worked for families in time of celebration in times of devastation and grief it worked so well but it's a beautiful village it's and today it's one of those villages that has I suppose benefited in a very measured way, you know, through the growth in our economy, in that it has a, sm- a small, sig- nice, significant number of new housing estates around the village where people have moved in with young families. We have gone from schools struggling to find children to fill classrooms to the schools being full to having to build new classrooms um, to you know, to, to having, as I said, the strongest juvenile football club in Wicklow. People would still look at you with eyes wide open when you say that, but it's, it is a reality. It's, it's a very strong community of community groups. It has the show, which I suppose was always the first in leadership and community and showed what, what was possible when people came together with goodwill, you know, and a vision to the town development group, to the tidy towns, to, you know, uh, to the art centre, which was a very ambitious project at the time it was initiated. It became very successful, you know, um, and, and also that we have a number of quite significant manufacturing businesses in the town as well. You have automatic plastics, you have Fitzgerald kitchens, you know, and a number, you know, those, those are probably the two biggest. We have one of the largest nurseries in Ireland, Creelton Nurseries in Ireland, just outside the village as well. So there's always work there, you know, whether you're a student, you know, whether you're, you're skilled, semi-skilled, whatever, there, there has been a source of employment there. And a community benefits greatly from that. So would you describe it as a very welcoming place? I think it is. I, I, I think it is. I'm sure it has its faults, and I'm sure there are those who have bad experience. But uh, if they have, I, I, I would be disappointed, and it, it would pain me if that happened. And what, what do you think is the best thing about living in an upland area? Uh, yeah. In today's world, it allows you, it allows you, to live in harmony with with nature and creation, while at the same time, through technology, to be able to have all the connections with the greater world of work and opportunity. And if you could change one thing about the area, what might that be? 
I I wouldn't change it, but I would do what I can to encourage people to maintain the richness of our past and to look at how best to secure that for the future because it has served us well, generally speaking. Yeah. And even thinking of the short and long term future, what challenges do you think that Tin Hilly and, and the broader Wicklow kind of mountain area will face? Yeah, I think Tin Hilly will not have the same challenges that other parts will have because we're, we're, we're too far away from the maddening crowd, which is Dublin to be impacted. For example, there might be, if you had a farm closer to Dublin, you will certainly may have more challenges from the point of view of, I don't know, whether it's unwelcome people coming onto your lands in an in a, a unorganised way. Uh, so you, you would have all of that for the sheep farmers, the problems with dogs from the States. and you know they, We don't have that down here. We don't have the risk of a community being split by a motorway. Right, and like, well, I think we're a bit out from a motorway going, going through Tinnahili and bypassing it. I think we're a little bit away from that. So I think we're, you know, we're, we're reasonably well insulated. You know, I'm not. For, I I don't think I'm positioned to comment on, on how the uplands areas further up will be impacted. I'm I'm not in a position to accurately say something on that. And so, what does it mean to you? Um, to be from living and these, you know, building your business and working in this area. Oh, I'm quite happy that this is my lot. Yeah, um, I'm not saying it's absolutely perfect or that every day has been a good day, but I do accept that this is where I am. This is my this is my job to do the best I can here, and I've been. I think I've been most fortunate. I've lived and worked here for 48 years so far please god i'll be given it for a few more years we have re- built our home raised our family live reasonably well so uh, in today's world i think that's what anybody would aspire to to have friends to have to belong to a community that you feel part of and that you're you never feel alone yeah that there are those around you who will support you and help you out And is there anything that we haven't discussed that you'd like to add to the record? I'm I'm just thinking about that one, Matthew. Um, I think it's important that that we all appreciate, you know, the good things that we have in our life. Okay. And that we appreciate that, you know, we must never become too insular where we only look at what our own needs are. That my hope would be that for people would become, would feel part of a community that, and that they could contribute in whatever way, big or small. We all come with our own gifts, right, uh, to, to, to benefit others and that in turn to receive the benefits that, that will come as well uh, and that you would do for others what you, you hope that others might do for you should you have a day of need yeah so that would be it and uh, like we live in an imperfect world Matthew we live in a perfect world and the world keeps throwing up unexpected challenges so we can't map out the future I've gone away from looking at five and ten year business plans you know I think yeah and it's not that you don't look forward that you don't try to speculate on what twists or turns are coming the only thing you can actually deal with is what's in front of you right now in the present moment so it's to try to live there uh, i would say to some people don't live in the past a lot of people live in the past the wrongs of the past it pulls them down it affects the quality of their life of their physical and mental well-being i think you have to acknowledge all the wrongs and maybe best to try and find out where are the wrongs today and do something about it so that your children won't say why didn't you do something about the wrongs that were taking place in your time because our own time is is so short not that it's insignificant but 
the greater scheme of things is really short yeah and uh, and to build strong communities to work and to be committed you know whether it's lobbying your local county councillor your local tds through your local organization whatever it is to build stronger communities because it's in strong strong communities that people will live and thrive that's great thank you very much joe um, and i'll just stop the recording now